As we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, today marks the start of part three of our sermon series on the nature and character of God. And we are going to be looking today at the question of God's Trinitarian nature, who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and why that matters, what sort of difference that makes in our lives and in the, the reality that we uh, live in. But before we get there, we want to remember, we want to remember this chart that we've got, that we've been given permission to look at. And in this chart, we see, uh, we see the reality of God in his character, God in his nature, how God is love, and that there are parts within that, both God's nature, his incommunicable attributes, and below that, his character, those attributes that we have in some uh, capacity or another and that we can grow in. And we just want to express, again, just gratitude for Karen Saure uh, from uh, the, info, the writer, the author of the Infographics Bible for giving us permission to, uh, for giving me permission to recreate uh, these, this graphic in particular and uh, give uh, just a shout out to her. Now, remember in this chart that we, we have love surrounding all of these things. And that is an important part of the context for us. But then today, as we zoom in and we, we pull out that, that picture of God's holiness and perfection and zoom in on God's relational characteristics, we look at his Trinitarian nature. Now, obviously, we cannot be Trinitarian. We cannot be three in one. That's just not going to work out. <laughs> but that being said, there is something essential about God's relational character, his three in oneness, that we do share. And we'll get into that. But first, we want to read a few Bible passages. We want to read from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. And in it, we read these words, Paul writing to the people of Rome, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption into sonship. And by Him, that is the Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, this particular passage highlights for us kind of the, the interaction between the Spirit and the Father and us, right? And, and the Spirit here acts almost like a binding agent. For those of you who, who, who love baking, uh, you know that often, uh, or cooking, that often eggs act as a binding agent to help the various ingredients that you are putting together stick together. Uh, you could call it also a binder, right? Uh, this is true also for chemistry. Uh, we have binding agents here. But more than that, in, in this particular passage, 
the Holy Spirit seems to act like a catalyst. And again, that's kind of a, a chemical phrase, uh, but it, it's also one that we use uh, when we talk about uh, society and, and, and changes in ourselves. A catalyst helps to transform us from one substance, in this case, a, a sinful, destined for death people who are enemies of God, to another substance, that is, adopted sons and daughters of God, who cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. Wikipedia says that a binder or binding agent is any material or substance that holds or draws other materials together to form a cohesive whole, mechanically, chemically, by adhesion or cohesion. It's almost like, again, like the Holy Spirit is like soap, <laughs> a bit like soap. The soap clings to oil and grease more strongly than the grease clings to the dishes. The Holy Spirit clings to us more strongly even than we cling to sin. The Holy Spirit pulls us away from the sin and into relationship with the Father. This is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does this out of selfless love for the Father. And this is really important. The Holy Spirit does this in selfless love for the Father. But before we dive more into that, let us look at John chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. In it we read this. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. And this is close to the end of Jesus' life on earth and before his crucifixion and resurrection. The hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now, there are a couple of really important things here that stand out. One is the reality of the closeness of the relationship between Jesus and between the Son and the Father. In this passage, we see that Jesus is one who shared glory with the Father before the world began. This is where we get into one of the ideas about the Trinity that theologians call um, the reality that they are co-eternal. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been, will always be. They never have not been. <laughs> that God did not create, that the Father did not create the Son, nor did the Father and the Son create the Holy Spirit, but rather that all three, all three in one, have always existed since before the world began. Now, I know that's a bit of a head scratcher, but there is also another key thing that's maybe a bit more um, relatable for us that we need to grab in here. 
And that is the selflessness of the relationship between the Father and the Son, between the Son and the Father. Jesus here is pointing out for the sake of his disciples, Jesus and for the sake of us, Jesus is pointing out that he came to earth and gave all the glory that he might have accumulated for himself. He gave all that glory to the Father, glory that, that rightfully belongs with the Father. And then he asks, that the Father would glorify him, not for his own sake, but for the sake of the people to whom Jesus was called. You see, it may be a bit head-twisting to try and figure all this out, but one thing is very, very clear, and that is the selflessness of the love of Jesus for the Father and the Father for Jesus. They are not doing what they are doing. He is not doing what he is doing out of self-interest. He is doing it out of love and selflessness. If we move on, or, or rather move back a bit, to John chapter 14, verses 25 to 27, we read Jesus saying these words to his disciples. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You see, here, a, a highlight of the relationship between Jesus and the Spirit. We saw the relationship between Father, Spirit, and us, and we saw uh, the relationship between Jesus and the Father and us, and now we see a highlighting of the relationship between Jesus and the Spirit and us. And you notice once again that the, the Spirit who the Father will send to us in Jesus' name, that Spirit is sent selflessly. Right? Notice that Jesus says, I do not give as the world gives. In other words, Jesus gives selflessly. Jesus gives without expecting all kinds of things in return. Sure, we need to behave properly, and sure, out of gratitude and out of the growth that is given to us by the Holy Spirit, we become more like he called us to be. But Jesus does not give with the strings attached that we as humans have. I'll give you this if you do this for me. That's not how God is. And it's certainly not how God is within himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So now we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean that God is Trinitarian, that he is three in one. Well, first of all, we need to remember, of course, the context. And the context here, as with everything else that we look at, is that God is love. Now, love is not a, a passive word. Love is not something that you just experience. Love is something that you do. Love is something that you exercise. Love is something that you give, right? And so one of the realities that we have to face is that it would not be logical to say God is love if there was ever a time when God could exist without relationship. 
You see, you cannot be love if you're not in relationship. And so if there was ever a time when God was single, one God, not in three persons, but one God, if there was ever a time when God did not live in relationship, then God could not be defined as love. God is love because God would not have been living for some portion of existence in a loving relationship, right? It wouldn't make any sense. But God is love. And so we know that, that the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have always existed together, have always lived in loving relationship. There was never a time in which they didn't. A fellow Reformed theologian named Jürgen Moltmann put it this way, Here there are no persons without relations, but there are no relations without persons either. Person and relations are complementary. In other words, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are partially defined in their unique character they're partially defined by their relationship to one another. They are distinct from one another as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, partially because of their relationship to one another. Another theologian, Miroslav Wolf, said, the divine persons, that is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are mutually related from the outset and are inconceivable without their relations. Furthermore, they manifest their own personhood and affirm that of other persons through their mutual relations of giving and receiving. As the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit give selflessly, endlessly to one another, receiving also from one another endlessly and selflessly, as they give to one another, they manifest who they are. You can see this sometimes in married couples who have been together for a long time and who love each other deeply, you almost come to the point where it would be difficult to define the one partner without the other. They are so much together in their relationship. As they give to one another, they help tell the world who they are, both as a couple and as individuals. In other words, brothers and sisters, the three persons are distinct from one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and their very distinctness is partially defined by their unity with one another as they completely, selflessly give to and receive from one another eternally. So, what does God's relationship, God's Trinitarian nature, have to do with us? And now, here, I have to give you permission. You may... Go back and watch this sermon over and over again, not because it's so great, but because it's recorded online. And if you're, head, you're scratching your head about what, what is Pastor Dan talking about, you can go back and you can listen again and you can work through it again. But we do have to ask ourselves the question, what does God's Trinitarian nature have to do with us? If God is eternally selflessly relational within God's self, 
And if we, you and I, are created in God's image, then surely, surely we were created to be in selfless relationships too. Surely that's what we were created for. An ancient symbol of the church shows the Trinity in this way. Each of the, the curving uh, lines on this diagram show the relationship between each of the persons of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Father. The relationship between them is eternal and it is consistent and constant and it is uh, unified one person three or one one god three persons so too you could say that we also were created not to be trinitarian in the same way that's why i changed the diagram so that it's a little bit different but we were created to be in relationship with God, with our fellow human beings, including ourselves, and with the creation. So, we were created in God's image, which means that we were created to be in selfless, loving relationships with God, with each other, and with God's creation. So now we ask, how are your relationships? Can you say that your relationships model the Trinitarian relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Can you say that you are in that kind of relationship or something resembling that kind of relationship on some level? Are you moving towards that kind of relationship? Are you living in the context of selfless love? Of course, not just you, but us we. Am I as an individual? Are you as an individual living the image of God in our daily lives? But also, how about us as a church community, as a congregation? Are we living selflessly loving relationships? Are we image bearers in that way? How are our relationships? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is eternally loving, eternally lovingly, selflessly in relationship. Are we living in God's image? Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are who you are. Thank you so much, great three in one, that you live in eternal, selfless, loving relationship constantly within yourself. Thank you so much that out of the overflow of your love, you created and sustained the heavens and the earth. Thank you so much that out of the overflow of your love, you created humanity. And thank you so much that you created us to be in your image, to live lives of loving, selfless relationship. 
As we examine ourselves, O oh God, we confess that we are so far from living lives that approach the kind of loving relationship that you have within yourself, O oh great three in one. At the same time, O oh God, we know that your Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the one that you have sent selflessly to live within us, that your Holy Spirit is working within us to grow us in this. And we thank you so much that your Son also was sent selflessly to repair and recreate the relationship between us and you and each other and this world. We thank you that you are making all things new. Lord, please help us to live in loving, eternal relationship with you through the power of your Son and the work of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.